This episode of Two Guys on Mobile is brought to you by Pontiflex App Leads. Go to www.appleads.com. It's time for Two Guys on Mobile, episode number 21. We are legal in the States. Dun, dun, dun. My name, Rob Woodbridge from Untethered.tv and the newly minted UntetheredMobile.com. Be sure to check that out. I'd appreciate it. And as always, found on Twitter at Rob Woodbridge and joined every week for 21 consecutive episodes by Mr. Jeff Bacon. Hey, Jeff is the uh, purveyor of all things that are uh, mobile at Ascension Cross Media. It can be found at the Suave Hog on Twitter and BaconOnTheGo.com on that whole the webs, the webs out there, the internets. Jeff, we uh, today's July third. We are two days past Canada's 144th birthday. We are a day before Independence Day, yet we are still bringing you what's cool, what's happening, what's important in the mobile world, aren't we? We never take a break. Doesn't matter what weekend it is. We're here and we're ready to go. Yeah, does that make us uh, national heroes somehow? I think it makes us non-drunks. Non-drunks, that's right. That makes Otherwise, me... we wouldn't be here at 10.30 in the morning doing a podcast. <laughs> that is true. Well, uh, you know, we're going to take a little bit of a departure today uh, from news items. And I think that we've got this, uh, uh, well, I don't even know how to describe it, a, uh, a burning desire to see companies succeed in mobile. And we look out and we look at opportunities all the time. I mean, certainly in what we do every day, we've seen some great opportunities out there. And so we've seen some companies that have exploited them, some companies who are emerging in them, and then some companies who have an opportunity to exploit them that are just sitting on their ass doing nothing. Right? So that's what this show is about. We've all picked, we both picked a, a, a couple of companies that we think are doing exception that that are doing exceptionally well perhaps in the other spheres like the web or in print or whatever it is uh, in media but aren't exploiting the opportunity or leveraging the opportunity that is mobile and we're going to talk about that and then we're going to finish off by maybe looking at a few companies that we think are going to be emerging in the next number of years or concepts that are going to be emerging in the next number of years that are going to uh, dominate we think in uh, in certain spaces uh, is that a good way to describe this show I think so. Yeah, definitely a future forward look at what people can do and what they might do and uh, what we'd like to see some people do, for sure. Well, so um, we put this together and uh, in, in no particular order, uh, but I think what we'll do is we, we will start with these companies that are out there right now that are dominating. We think that there are big companies. These are 100 million plus uh, install base. These are, well, maybe not you know driving towards that. Some of these guys are, are big enough uh, to be their own countries, ultimately, and um, large nations. And we're going to start with those guys and, and missing the opportunity that we think that, that they should be doing inside of mobile. Ready to start this? Let's go. All right, well, uh, I, I think that, uh, you, you know, there's two themes that we've chosen here, and I think that the one that you you are focusing on certainly is uh, is the one that's most prescient, most relevant to a lot of people in, uh, you know, on a general side because it has an impact, a very disruptive impact on a lot of companies and the way that we consume media. So let's start with your big play. Sure. Uh, I, th- I mean, we I have a few of them, but I think the first one to start with is one that may seem a little obvious to some people, but and it's hard to criticize a company when you know their value is predicted to start with a B, as in in the billions of dollars, to say, wow, really, guys, you should be doing something different because you're obviously doing things right. So it's not to say that this company has been doing things wrong, but Zynga has a big opportunity. You know, they just said that they they filed with the uh, they filed with the SEC for um, some sort of IPO. I think it's uh, about a billion dollars worth of their IPO, and said that they've got 263 million monthly active users on their games, mostly on Facebook, or the, the vast majority on Facebook. But they virtually have no presence in mobile right now. They have a couple of mobile apps, but I mean they're okay, and they don't tie into their Facebook crowd, and they, it's not. It's obviously like a kind of a pet project for someone there at Zynga, not something that the company has focused their attention spotlight on for good reason. And that as you're making millions and millions and millions of dollars and generating a billion dollar company, it's hard to diverge your focus into smaller projects and, and give them the way that they need. But you know, over the next few years, as you know, Facebook 
growth is going to level out or has leveled out, and the revenue generated on there is is probably going to level out over the next five years or require some significant innovations, the easiest thing for Facebook to do to drive some extra revenue is going to be to dive into mobile. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that the thing that is most interesting there is not on Facebook's side, because on Facebook's side, it's like, great, we're going to make extra money. But the thing that's going to happen is if they are going to tell those 263 million monthly users, hey, we also have these mobile applications, but those users are not, you know, dicking around with their uh, mobile phones right now on just business applications, pardon the expression. They're actually using games right now. They're playing with games and they're paying money for games right now. So when Zynga says, hey, by the way, we've got all these games on mobile as well, what's going to happen to the revenue streams that exist right now? They're not going to go up by $500 million. They're going to take most of that $500 million that Zynga will make out of the pockets of people right now selling content and selling free-to-play games on mobile. Yeah, and Zynga has um, some games. Like they have farm, they they ported Farmville over uh, to Tepid Reviews and uh, Poker, and, and, you know. But they have uh, by by count they have five games. Well, drop seven twice. So there's a free version and there's a paid version. Uh, Cityville, Farmville, and Zynga Poker, and they have uh, Mafia Wars as well. Mafia Wars on on the iPhone app. But um, Mafia Wars on the iPhone app is just, it's like a separate game. It doesn't connect to the Facebook game at all. It doesn't bridge those communities. It's just that they went, oh, we'll make a Mafia Wars game over onto Facebook and, or onto iPhone. And I'm not sure they've even been successful as a company like Storm 8, which no. has you know, millions and millions of downloads of theirs, and they don't even have a connection to Facebook. It's mobile only for Storm 8. So. Well, it's funny because you're right. You know, when you look at uh, some of these guys, some of these games, they have maybe 150 ratings. This is a company that drives what 230 million uniques or unique users a month. 3 million users a month on Facebook. And they're getting 150 reviews on an iPhone or an iPad app. It shows that there's a big gap obviously uh, that they're not exploiting it. Have have you heard of a company called Tiny Co? The name rings familiar. They yeah, have a mobile game there. company uh, out of uh, the Bay Area um, and uh, they're a uh, Andreessen Horowitz uh, funded company. That I mean, they've got eighteen million dollars, and these guys consider themselves the the Zynga for mobile. They're using the Zynga business model for for mobile, and and they have uh, you know games like Tiny Zoo or Top Resort or Tiny Chef, which are basically uh, um, you know the equivalent to like Farmville. Um, you know, we we both know uh, West Ham who uh, created Barstar, which is the time management applications, and that's where these guys fit in Tiny Nightclub, and these guys. You know, Tiny Zoo has more ratings than uh, than Farmville does, right? Um, and a higher uh, average rating on the on the App Store, and uh, they they have more applications available on the App Store than Zynga does. So, a- absolutely, this this is a huge failing when it comes to uh, to this. But how much more could they grow as a result of engaging with mobile? Do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's not necessarily about how much more they can grow. It's about continuing their growth, right? So they, they're on Facebook and they've ridden the Facebook wave. They, they became the number one uh, gaming provider on Facebook and they rode the Facebook wave to 700 million plus users and growing. Just like Magmic did the same thing on BlackBerry. When BlackBerry started, we became the top BlackBerry gaming company and rode the BlackBerry growth wave. And that once you're at number one, as you add more devices and more people, they tell their friends, go here to get good content. And so for a while, you can ride that wave and rim rode the wave of mobile in the same way that they can continue to sell more devices as, as the mobile industry um, grows. So Zynga is going to have a second phase of their life, which they're going to have to diversify to make sure that they're not, um, that like, it's hard to have billion, a billion dollar company in which another company can kill you with a policy change. Right. So Zynga needs to protect themselves against Facebook deciding, hey, Maybe we should be the top gaming company on Facebook, and then just basically killing Zynga. So they need to they need to build that in from when, when they go public and they have real invest like not real investors, but you know a public market investors. They need to be conscious of where their risk management is, and by spreading across platforms, with mobile being the easiest and obvious choice to go to next, it starts to diversify their user base a bit and bring them across different platforms. So a policy change of one platform isn't necessarily critical to. Uh, the success of their business and their revenue stream. So Zynga, I mean, uh, yeah, they're they're filing to go public. Uh, you you'd hope that they would use some. They'd keep a lot of that money, unlike uh, something like Groupon. They keep that money in the company and uh, and expand on this mobile play. They've certainly got enough money. 
you, you know, the um, uh, it, it, maybe they're looking at it like, you know, don't fix what ain't broke kind of thing, right? And and they're doing exceptionally well on the Facebook side, and they're expanding into other platforms. Um, but I guess it's a gradual approach. They don't want to destroy their brand. But the risk here, I guess what you're saying is that if they don't do it, they're going to destroy their brand anyways. They're leaving a big hole for other companies to come in. Yeah, so far, in, if you looked at, if Zynga looked out, you know, five years in their company, and if they, if they say, look, we're going to have a five-year plan, and honestly, any mobile company that says they have a 10-year plan is blown, blown smoke, because you just cannot predict things. Even five years out is it's very, very, difficult. very, very difficult, but if you have a five-year plan, it means you can be pretty confident in what you're going to do over the next few years, and you're going to say the last two years of your five-year plan are just kind of goalposts that you'd like to be in. And they've been able to look at Facebook's growth and social media growth over the last five years and say, okay, yes, our five-year plan is still that this um, sector is strong, this sector is going forward, we'll keep an eye out on whatever else is going, but for now, we're all in on the social gaming play. And it's been, and it's been good. But now when you look five years out, the social and social gaming plays are evolving, right? Foursquare didn't exist five years ago. Yep. Social, social activity outside of basic, like, talk to your friends has evolved. And if you look five years out from now, it's not going to be about the social area anymore. That's just going to be a part of everything. And you can't differentiate yourself by saying you're social. Right. Well, I, I, so Zynga, it was your choice. And I think that that's a, that's a great choice uh, because there's a company that has a massive opportunity that, um, you know, when you start to get into that kind of valuation and those kind of revenue numbers, you have to add zeros and it gets more and more difficult. Um, maybe this is their secret weapon. We'll see. So Zynga, not exploiting mobile to the amplitude that they should. Um, my my choice for this, which is a uh, along the same lines, a big company just went public, a company called LinkedIn. Uh, now, I, I know pe a lot of people use it because there are over 100 million accounts that are, of people that are using it, but a lot of people uh, are now kind of warming up to LinkedIn, I think. And um, it's predominantly web-based. They do have a, an iPhone application, which is, uh, you know, accesses your web profile, uh, your profile on LinkedIn. It accesses all your contacts. It's painfully slow. It crashes all the time. The experience has gotten better, but it's still not the best application out there. I don't know if anybody, I'm going to assume a lot of people have downloaded this thing, if you're a LinkedIn user. But um, it, the application it, um, uh, is want for uh, features. What what LinkedIn is, link, li, like you use LinkedIn, don't you, Jeff? I, I do use it. I use it mostly on the web. I have the mobile app installed, but I actually don't, I don't use it very much because I don't actually interact with LinkedIn on a daily basis. I interact with it more like on a weekly basis. And so I don't tend to have applications that I use regularly on my mobile device that I'm not using more than once a week. I, I shouldn't say that. I have 200 applications on my mobile device, and I don't use all of them more frequently than once a week, but something like LinkedIn is there, but quite regularly because it interacts with me via email on a regular basis, that I end up clicking the link on the email and going through, through that on my desktop because on the mobile side, if I get the email, I click a link, it doesn't open the mobile client, it opens the website, it doesn't open a mobile website, it opens a desktop website, and so yeah. then I say, forget it, I'll just wait till I get to my desktop and use it there. Well, this is the this is the big problem. Is that not only do they do they try to think that they get mobile? I mean, the application was an afterthought and it was terrible when it started. It's just getting much better. But what they're missing out are, the, are from the basic standpoint. You think about mm -hmm. just getting a mobile version of the website so that it's accessible, you know, and, and contextualized to the mobile device. That's one of the big challenges. But where I think that they're missing the biggest opportunity, they have a huge install base of active users. Active users, a hundred million people. I don't know how many people log in every day. But there's a considerable amount of activity. They run things like uh, company profiles. They have uh, you know your own inbox. That stuff. Who cares? What's very interesting is the events area that they have. The question and answers. They call it answers. The company buzz. The polls. Um, they have uh, a lot of applications that bring into it. The reading lists. All this kind of stuff. That uh, and your contacts. Your contacts. They have a huge opportunity to be able to contextualize this, put this in a wrapper around an application that says, listen, I'm at this conference. I've checked into a conference. And by the way, that was an event that was on my event list that I wanted to go to or that I was registered for. Oh, by the way, th 38 of my contacts are here and they're located over here, here and here and here. And oh, by the way, 
19 people that are, you know, of, of the people that I wanted to uh, introduce myself are here as well. And you should go and find that like, there's a huge opportunity around contextualizing that information around events, organizing events, checking into events, uh, having tickets for events, uh, you know, the, the entire event uh, bright uh, concept around uh, pricing and, uh, and purchasing events and managing that side. That's, that's one of it. The other thing is that, uh, you know, uh, I certainly think that LinkedIn has an opportunity with that install base of disrupting something like Qu Quora, which is the Q&A uh, um, website that should never exist, right? Th that site should have been inside of LinkedIn. And uh, they do have an answers thing and it launched before Quora. But uh, why not, uh, why not uh, you know, push that out a little bit more? Make it so that it's part of the application. Who cares about news and buzz uh, on my device? Because I'm getting that from everywhere. Let's start to actually add some value to the LinkedIn mobile experience and not just be a conduit for the data that's already stored. They just have done a terrible job contextualizing this stuff. And I think that there's, what that says to me is that there's a big opportunity yeah, for I think, a company I mean, like LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a good example of a company where you can look at it and say it's doing a lot of things really, really well. And it's doing connecting with people. It's the way it has designed its social network it works really well for, for LinkedIn. Yep. But it has an opportunity to expand from there. Something like, like Twitter, I don't think has that kind of an opportunity because it's building a social network, but it's such a, a niche uh, area of what you use it for. You don't use it for as many things as you use something like LinkedIn where people are gathered together. Facebook similarly has yep. grown to events and, and pictures and things like that on more of a personal side. And LinkedIn, when you look at it, you say, well, you know, there's Quora and there's Eventbrite and there's Local Mind. And there's all these kind of services set up around finding people who know things, and especially people at events who know things, Foursquare even. You know, LinkedIn really has the opportunity where, when's, what do I use LinkedIn for? It's my business contacts. Yep. Well, where do business people go? Conferences all the time. And whether you call that an event or whether you call that a social gathering for people within your um, friend group within LinkedIn or your secondary group. So knowing, look, there's not just, you know, 50 people that you know here. There's a thousand people that you could meet. Right. Because there's 50 people who you know here. Yep. So if one of those people you want to know, here's the people to connect to. You want to text, message them right now and say, hey, what are you up to? And it comes to news. It's like localized news. So what are people around you in your list at the event you're talking about interested in? You bring all that stuff into the context that LinkedIn already has in an intelligent way. So you don't just have like 27 buttons all over screen to go into things. That's where you're right. There's, there's a huge future value in that. Can you imagine uh, going to a conference and, and you know, there's there's conference apps out there that have the agenda and have who's there and who's here and specials and all that stuff. But can you imagine stamping yourself at an event, right? Stamp, like, I'm here. I went to this event. And then always having a reference point of who was there at that moment. So you have a, a basically an opening dialogue with those people that you wanted to communicate with or wanted to communicate with you. It's, you know, taking a stamp of, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a piece of time and saying, listen, I was at this conference. I mean, there's a uh, conference that I'm involved in called the App Develop Application Developers Conference. It's in the fall, and stamping myself there, and then having access to, you know, the list of people that are part of the LinkedIn network that were there as well, reaching out, communicating with those guys, or part of the groups. I just think that, you know, what this does, if they're looking at this properly, should dwarf their website activity because of mobile because it's contextual because uh because if they exploit this properly they use this properly um there's people are going to find much more value out of this and this is where com companies like bump uh and dave Lieb are, are are moving into and and i think that uh you know it started off as a way to exchange contacts but now it's it's a way to actually connect with somebody and i think that that's really what linkedin is missing they should be looking at these companies uh, my opinion, LinkedIn should buy Bump, they should buy Eventbrite, they should bring all these companies together and create that great mobile experience, but I don't think that they will. I'm hoping. Yeah, I don't know if, they're, uh, if their culture is of uh, purchasing external companies to augment what they have. They've, they've evolved their platform to allow people to tie into their platform, but yeah. only in like a superficial way, in kind of adding a box to it. Like, you know, TripIt is a great tie-in to LinkedIn, but it doesn't really integrate. It just puts a little box on your screen and shares your contacts so you can see where people are, where people are going. But if they integrated stuff like that and like and as you said, like Cora and like bump much more deeply into it, and uh, I think that there's much better potential for those companies to leverage the hundred million LinkedIn users yeah. and grow than there is to try and build their own user base and grow from there. Absolutely. So. Well, 
Well, LinkedIn. Um, I just think that there's a there's a massive opportunity, um, even to just put out your skills and and have people know who you are. And and uh, I mean, it's very effective. Uh, you know, if you if you uh, it's my go-to place for finding resources and finding people that I need to communicate with. So hopefully they can they can move that into the mobile space. LinkedIn, get your stuff in gear, get mobile, because what you've done here, like I, 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 you know, as much as I use this uh, the mobile app, uh, they don't have an iPad version, which is fine because it's a full web experience on the on the uh, on the on the tablets. But uh, it, it's like I don't need to change my theme. I don't need to change the color of the theme. I don't need to change, you know, you know, the in-person is a good opportunity to exploit that. And that's what we're talking about uh, contact and events. Um, but, uh, you know, the connections component is, is tough. It's slow. It's cumbersome. Get mobile. That's all I'm going to say about LinkedIn. Get mobile. Uh, this is, I think the last two that you're going to talk about, um, we both agree with uh, being Major League Baseball fanatic right here. Go Yankees. Um, and uh, and uh, when it comes to media, because it's the last bastion for me to drop cable. So let's talk about this. Yeah. So I mean, right now, uh, entertainment, video entertainment content really falls into three categories. You have movies, you have television shows, and you have live sporting events. And I'm not going to include non-live sporting events because that's just wrong. So you know it's either it's what would those live be? Sporting, ESPN sorry, replay of darts. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever you, whatever you see at 3 a.m. on the uh, ESPN Ocho, um, <laughs> your uh, live sports. But so there's three categories there of entertainment content, which cable companies, Comcast, Rogers, um, Verizon, all those companies are, are basically providing you access to for your monthly fee. And there's three companies that are really taking hold of the reins of those categories and are starting to become market leaders. One is obvious on the movie side, which is Netflix, and they're already doing a good job of having a mobile strategy and, and moving into mobile there, and I think that that's, that's going to play out to be a major competitor to Apple over the long term in terms of providing movie content that instead of getting it through Apple and paying for it, that your $8 a month uh, Netflix subscription will work on all those platforms. So I'm going to leave Netflix aside because I think they're already on a really good path to, to owning that space. And the two other sections is TV and, and sports. And so... The, the television one is the next one that's most close to movies. And Netflix it has some, some television stuff in place there already. But there is a company that major television studios and broadcasters already trust and go to with their content, and that's Hulu. And Hulu was started by television companies to provide an ownership level on the distribution of their own content. And it's now for sale. So these companies have decided, you know what, we're not in the business of running a distribution company. We're in the business of producing television shows. And so Hulu is now looking to uh, move out under, from under the umbrella of the television studios like CBS and, and, and Viacom and, and et cetera. So this Hulu company, it, it basically they stream television shows um, with and without ads uh, over, the, over the internet. And they do have some mobile presence. Like there's an Android app for Hulu. And they connect to some set-top boxes as well and, and some TVs. But Right now, they haven't said, you know what, we are going to make this massive play to get all of our content on all mobile devices and be your go-to source, no matter what device you are on, for television shows like Netflix is doing for movies. And I said when I heard that they were for sale that if I could find a group of people to purchase that company, I don't care what the price was, I'd buy it in a second because they are right now have a brand that is um, recognized and that's big. To have their brand. Netflix is big because you know what? When people think about online movies and renting them, they think about Netflix. They've owned that brand space, the mindshare. Hulu is owning that mindshare for television online. They've successfully, I think, penetrated to at least a deeper level. It's not, it's not totally a mass market brand yet, but it's well on its way to getting there. And if you own the, what, oh, where should I get TV shows? Oh, I've heard of Hulu. Let me check it out. You own that customer right away without doing any work. It's funny because uh, you know there's uh, workarounds for cable. Um, you know, cable subscribers they can get their TV anywhere on their iPad apps and their iPhone apps, and you can just get your, what's what's uh, what is that box? The uh, like the boxy box and the well, uh, they got the boxy box and um, slim box or uh, or uh, I know what you're talking about. It's the one where you transmit your television signals over the yeah, and it starts with an S. Sling box. Sling box. That's it. Yeah, Leo Laporte uh, pushes pushes that through the Twit network, and, and um, it's it's one of those things that I think is a uh, is a solution looking for a problem. Um, 
I, I don't want my cable to be broadcast in real time wherever I am. What I want is to be able to watch whatever I want, whenever I want it, on whatever screen I want. So yeah. these guys, um, I, I, I mean, something like Slingbox is five years dead. Like, it should have been gone a long time ago. And uh, I think that Hulu has an opportunity to disrupt that completely. It's like what uh, what Netflix is doing to the movie industry. And, and really, some of the TV shows as well, the older TV shows. It's on demand. When I was like 11 years old, which was decades ago, I talked to my father about this, is that uh, when, uh, when on-demand movies came uh, to, uh, to Canada, and uh, I said, you know, there's going to be a time where I'm going to be able to watch whatever I want to watch whenever I want to watch it. And my father looked at me and said, no, you're crazy, kid. Go back to the whatever. Go back to Dungeons and Dragons or whatever it is that you're doing. Keep smoking that crack. And, and w w you know, so literally 30 years later, we're now talking about this. It's finally coming true. Uh, where where uh, companies like Hulu and Netflix are, are going to do this. And, and um, it doesn't have to be on my 47-inch screen. It, it should be on my tablet. It should be wherever I am. It should be in a, in a hotel room to occupy my kids with, with programming that I want them to see, right? Well, the Slingbox is the equivalent of Diera Music. It's, it's content providers saying, you know what? Okay, you can have it. And we won't sue them out of oblivion because they're providing it within the constraints of what we have and that you're already paying for it and we're providing the way that you're going to see it. Which is how DRM Music and iTunes started off with content providers saying, no, this is the restrictions on how you're going to use it. Yeah. And then eventually it broke down. It didn't work because it only met the very basic needs of people and didn't meet the needs of people saying, well, this isn't exactly how I want to consume this content. And so I'm going to find ways to consume it the way I want to consume it. Yeah. And Slingbox is in that same spot right now. It's approved by the content provider saying, you know what, people are still paying for their stuff, we're okay, go see it wherever you want, because we know at least you have to pay for it while doing it. And it solved a lot of problems, just like DRM Music was very, very successful. But over time, people go, well, you know what, it's not that I want to watch HGTV and what's on right now, it's that Homes on Homes from last night is the show I wanted to watch. Or it's not that the soap opera this afternoon is what I want to see, it's that last night I was at a party and I missed CSI. And I want to watch CSI right now because yep. I don't have anything to do it going on this afternoon. So, you know, that change of on-demand consumption, as you say, is what's going to force providers to change the way they provide access to that content. And cable companies can do this. Rogers, Comcast, if they decide, you know what, we're going to say in 10 years from now, the actual cable business we have is going to be a marginal amount of our revenue. We are going to start right now to switch people over to watching stuff online anywhere you want. They could extend that life a lot further and start owning their customers with their own branded solutions that are like Hulu. But they're not doing that. And it's the same way that the music industry didn't do it. It's the protectionist of your existing revenue base and not wanting to disrupt that, which is why you need other companies like Apple on the music side. And I think Hulu on the television side to come in and say, we don't have an existing revenue base to support. We are generating revenue for our content providers via advertising, via subscriptions. And it's going to be the way things are distributed in the next five to 10 years. Well, I, I completely agree, you know, and even beyond that is that even the stations are getting into it now. I mean, in Canada, and I think in most of the United States, I can go to CTV or Fox and I can watch other shows on demand. Quality is not great, but you know what? I mean, it's an era of where, where YouTube videos are, are high quality enough to watch anyways. And, and so if I miss a show, I, I'm more likely just to not go to the Rogers on Demand in Canada. Uh, I'm just likely to uh, boot it up on my iPad and uh, and watch a show wherever I am. Uh, well, well, in Canada, it's limited to, to within Canada who your pr provider is. Um, but that's something that that uh, I mean, this is a highly competitive space. Now, the only thing that keeps me on cable is the fact that I can't watch live sports. Right? That's the only thing. Absolutely. So let's talk about this, though, which is you know, I'm a subscriber to MLB.tv. I watch, you know, 160 of the 162 uh, Yankees games. I listen to it wherever I am. I am involved in it. Um, I listen to it on my iPhone. I watch it on my iPad. I watch it on my television set. I watch it everywhere I can. This is a perfect example of, uh, of how media is going to be distributed and watched going forward, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, you know baseball um, was one of the easier sports to make this transition, partly because uh, there's a lot of baseball fans who are ultimately stats and so they're willing to you know, go online, they're willing to download an application that was about finding more information about the games that they're watching. So yeah. provided an in to get an application in front of their hands. They want to know what's going on. They're not always just interested in their team. 
like a lot of sports, you get a lot of sports fans who are really team fans, right? They're they're interested in their team. That's what they enjoy, which is fine. They're not really interested in the the bottom team. Where you get a lot of baseball fans who pay attention to what's going on within the baseball community and the baseball industry, not just specifically about their their team. And that's partly due with the stats thing because. In order to compare how good your player is and look at those stats, you have to understand how good the other players are. And when you see their stats, you want to see how they change. So the MLB started off by providing a lot of information digitally and then has evolved that into, I'm not sure if MLB Advanced Media is a wholly owned subsidiary of MLB or a division of MLB, but I, I believe the, the goal is to actually break that out into a wholly owned subsidiary as a company itself. Yeah. And MLB Advanced Media runs their mobile applications, runs their websites, runs the streaming games. You can literally watch every single baseball game that is played in Major League Baseball live on your net or on your mobile device. And it's in really good quality. It's not like it's shitty broadcast quality. Like no, some it's HD. Stuff. It is very, very high quality. Their mobile applications have layered stuff on top of that. You, you have the iPad application, that you, and you got that basically right after the iPad. It was just like, holy crap. I can pull up stats left, right, and center and overlay on the screen. You can basically produce your own stats-based MLB show yep. while you're watching the game. And that's, that's big. And so providing those options, providing the enhanced viewing capabilities. So even if I'm on the go, I can listen to the radio broadcast. I can sign up for push alerts from when events happen. You know, listening to a, on a baseball game on the radio is one of the best uh, sports to actually do that with. But when you pair it with their application where you get alerts when something happens with the video on it. So five minutes after you hear about a play, your device buzzes, you click play, you watch the video clip, and you go back to doing it. So you it's can amazing. do a whole bunch of other stuff while you're watching, watching the game. It's really, they really got it, and they've, they're starting to expand that. MLB Advanced Media runs the NHL's website now. And that division within MLB is poised to be the market leaders and potentially really have sports you know, running on their platform in the future. You know, and this is, you know, the reason that we, we bring this up now is because um, when you when you start to think about uh, companies that aren't getting this, um, it, this is what it is. It's about the cable companies not understanding the impact that mobile is going to have. Um, and and these disruptors like MLB uh, coming up and, and taking, taking what was once a premium service and offering it off now just as in anything. And, and it's, they went mobile first. They built it up from the mobile. Uh, so the experience is, is overwhelmingly great. Um, and I can see a future when I, I will subscribe for, you know, 200 bucks a year and get every live sport wherever I am. And this is where you start to think engagement. And this is if I'm a cable company, if I'm a, a content producer, if I'm relying on like ESPN or TSN or uh, Sportsnet or SportsCenter, uh, I look at this and think, oh my God, how are we gonna? How do we win in this? How do we win here? And right now, those companies are not looking. They're they're providing sports scores and updates, but they're not. They don't have. They don't own the content, and this is the biggest challenge. And that's where you you can tell which of these sports companies get the future and which don't get the future. Yeah. ESPN gets it. They do not just provide live sports. They right. have intentionally um, set a path for the company to provide editorial content, to provide shows, to provide entertainment content that is not just about tuning in to watch your live sports broadcast. And I'm not sure that I know people who would would choose to pay for ESPN that would make that decision differently if there was less live sports there. Because right. of the quality of other content, the quality of the opinions, the editorial content, the website, all that stuff put together, they have this platform. You know, Rogers in Canada, Rogers Sportsnet, is looking at ESPN and saying, we want to go in that direction. Because they have even more than ESPN has. They actually have a distribution network. They own a sports team in the Blue Jays. They own, they will own, when they when they finally pony up for it, the, the baseball team and the, the basketball team and the football team, the, sorry, the, uh, the soccer team, and the hockey team in Toronto. They're going to own that media market. And they're going to produce this platform in which it's not just about having the live sports, it's about having access to all that content. And they're they're kind of putting this in place saying, we're going to protect our investment in this cross-media platform by owning the content that's there. So, you know, on one sense, it's good in that it's saying, what they're saying is, you know what, we, we can't make this, like, cut the cord transition. We can't say cable is no longer there. Nobody can say that because no. the infrastructure is there and it's going to be there for a long time. And what, what they're saying is, if we have to transition, if we have to force people to keep subscribing to cable by having exclusive content, we can do that. Or if we need to force people to access our digital stuff by having exclusive content, we also have that in place. 
So ESPN is missing that piece, but ESPN has such a strong worldwide brand that that's, they don't they don't need it. You know, another company, it's a Canadian company based out of Toronto, is called The Score, um, and it's a it's a niche yep. it's a niche channel. Um, sports channel uh, with a reach I think it's a two or four million person reach in Canada which is pretty significant it's over 10 percent of the population um, but what they've what they've done is their mobile strategy has been unbelievable so they can't afford to license all live events so they license some live events particularly like UFC and and uh, you know some of the the up-and-coming sports at least they were up and coming before they took off they did soccer while well, soccer was growing absolutely and uh, what they've what they've done uh, for example in the soccer space is that they built a uh, you know a, a soccer app targeted to Europe where they have almost as much engagement with that app as they do with their television channel in Canada and and the score media uh, the score mobile um, is an app that's downloaded many m millions of times or across North America. In fact, there are people in southern United States that don't even know that the score is a television channel in Canada. Mobile first strategy. These guys understand it. They have personalities and content creation that is not relying on live sports. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. They, uh, they actually have more downloads from the U.S. than they do from Canada yeah. for their mobile applications. And you're right, a lot of people in the U.S. just think it's a, it's a sports app, right? And they're engaged. With, and to be honest, I mean, the app... It's not is okay, but it's not it's not fantastic or anything. Like it's not like you look and like oh my god, this is an amazing application. But it provides the content people want, yeah. and it provides it in a form. It provides access to that people want. And you're right in terms of what Score Media is doing is you know Score Media has a has a few podcasts, but you know one in particular they took two of their uh, top on air personalities in uh, Tim McAuliffe and Nathan <coughs> Sparrow, who were doing you know your basic your Sports Center style up updates. Although and if you watch Score Media live. You'll see their 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 um, you know, sports updates um, sets and everything are, are not like everybody else's. No. They have guys standing up and talking, not just sitting behind a desk and engaging with customers. So they took these two personalities last year and they started a podcast with it. And they started it the week it was free. There's no advertising in it. It's it's also uh, simulcast on the uh, a serious uh, network. They've got hardcore sports on the uh, serious radio there. But they start with weekly and they switched last September to daily on it. And they get like millions of downloads off that and it's basically it's publicity there's no ads there's no cost they're not making direct revenue off of it they're making indirect revenue off of it by if i'm look if i'm hearing about the score stuff on that i'm thinking about the score media i'm thinking about the applications they have yep. and i'm involved in that score media universe and that's that's big and you see like you saw tsn and uh they had the reporters they have a the espn has the reporters on sunday morning which is a some newspaper reporters that sit down and talk about uh relevant sports stories it's a good show the TSN has the equivalent here in Canada. And they decided, okay, we're going to try putting it on a podcast. So first, all they put was like the final word, the last five minutes of each show on. Then they put the whole show on without advertising, and now they don't put anything on or they put the five minutes again. They don't, they don't quite understand the fact that, yes, you are giving your show away for free. You're giving that content away for free, but there's a larger issue there is that I can't watch that show live. So you are not losing me as a customer because I'm not watching it live anyways, but I'll listen to the podcast. I'll engage with your media more if I'm engaged with your personalities more, which is why Rogers is doing a, a good job of hiring away notable sports columnists from in and around Toronto, particularly the Globe and Mail. They're rating that Globe and Mail pretty good in terms of bringing them on because they understand that the personalities, it's the content, it's the ESPN model of get people who are personalities, who people trust, who people like to listen to, and spread them across your network. Bill Simmons is the best example of that in the United States, for sure. Well, it's a brand, and certainly, so I did an, a, a couple of interviews with Tom Hearn, uh, who's the CFO for the Score Media, um, and he, he talked about the impact that mobile's having on their business, and this is something that's staggering. He said, they said he and his CEO debate this back and forth, but anywhere between, over the, by the next, within the next three years, Advertising revenue uh, from the mobile applications and the mobile department of the Score Media will will overshadow their revenues that they get from the television advertising. That is so significant. They've done this exceptionally well. So check out the Score uh, for for a great way of leveraging mobile. And this is the future. This is this is what companies need to be able to do to bring that mobile play in. And this is where we think that a lot of the the teams. A lot of the sports stations, a lot of the, the cable providers are missing. And it's a good way to summarize, like Hulu and MLB. I, I've been a subscriber from MLB since it was it looked like it was 8-bit television, right? It was terrible. But, man, I could get Yankees broadcasts here, not late at night on 88 uh, AM uh, WCBS, just because it happened, there was no interference at night, but live 
all the time. I'm standing in a checkout line at the grocery store. I'm watching Derek Jeter take an at bat. Awesome. I know. And you know, then the next the next change, the minor change they have to make to that, which is the next evolution there, is that right now sports have blackouts all over the place right. for, for various reasons. If you're sports. in Toronto, you can't watch the Jays games. Exactly, and and that's only because they're trying to encourage you to watch the local broadcast right. of the Jays game, which doesn't make any sense at all because they could just show that exact local broadcast with commercials yeah. in their mobile application, and then. What does Rogers care if you're showing it there? They're still selling commercials, and they use those numbers as part of their commercial advertising. That's the next step for you know sports media and television media as well in terms of broadcasting. Is that you know commercials are going to come back in at some point? The content has to be paid for, yep. and that's fine. You just have to bring them back in in a form and in a way that customers are going to accept and that customers are going to going to pay for. So maybe it's subscriptions that is basically paying for non-commercials within your content. Uh, maybe it's in order to get access to your blacked out content, you have to accept that you're going to watch commercials in those cases. That's fine. That that floats everybody's boat up a little bit higher. Well, that's a great thing about being in Ottawa is that we don't have any baseball or NFL teams or yeah, CFL teams. They still get blacked out, though. Yeah, but uh, I can still watch my Yankees anywhere except for New York, so uh, sorry. And speaking of advertising, speaking of revenue generating, got to take a little break here because i got to actually bring to your attention uh, – our great sponsor, which is Pontiflex App Leads, which actually allows you to make some more money with your applications. Maybe MLB or all these application makers should start to look at Pontiflex. Even, maybe even the Score Media should. Pontiflex is sign-up ads, uh, which are non-disruptive. They don't take, you out of the, uh, take your users out of your application. It happens all within the context of your application based on your requirements, what you want to feed them, the types of advertisers are top top 50 brands. Um, and it, what it does is it actually allows you to build a mailing list at the same time as you're actually advertising and generating revenue. Some of the responses that uh, some of the uh, yeah, some of the responses that a lot of these companies have had that have used Pontiflex app Pontiflex app leads are uh, up to a hundred times the average revenue numbers that something you know some of their competitors are offering as well. And uh, there's an advert there's a, a, an episode up on on tether.tv by Tune Me, which is a really interesting company um, that uses Pontiflex app leads. And these guys uh, almost overnight started generating, uh, you know, 10 to 12 to 15, sometimes up to 20 times the revenue that they were getting from the other ad networks. So we love Pontiflex app leads because we love mobile application developers like you uh, or people that you know generating revenue so that we can actually get some more product out of you because if we've got it installed, we want some more. We want updates. We want consistent new products. And generating revenue is one way to do that through Pontifex App Leads. So go to appleads.com. We love the fact that they're doing this. We really appreciate them uh, as a sponsor. And if you ever bump into anybody from Pontifex, tell them that you heard it from this show, Two Guys on Mobile. That's Pontifex App Leads at appleads.com. Love those guys. Love them. All right, uh, we're going to switch over here. Uh, we've taken a look at some of the companies that are uh, we think that have opportunities, taking our, our typical left turns every once in a while, but uh, opportunities to expand. We've looked at, um, at Zynga. We've looked at Hulu. We've looked at MLB. We've looked at the carriers or the, uh, the cable providers, and we've looked at LinkedIn. I want to turn our attention now just you know for five or six minutes here about companies that we see that are kind of in that I don't know. It's the lava. It's the creation space here that we think that are going to be dominant companies in the coming year or so, or the concepts are going to be dominant in the coming years. So we got to keep this a little bit short. Uh, but um, you know, I I have a personal affinity to um, not wasting space and time, and actually generating a little bit of income as a result of downtime. And this is where you know there was a big phase uh, during the eBay days about where people were selling unused clothes you know they'd go in their into their closet and they'd say what am i not wearing what have i not worn in the last month i'm going to sell it and basically i'm going to have 30 days worth of uh clothes and i'm going to just recycle those and through ebay and generate revenue from that from uh as much residual income as i can or you know leftover income uh after basically renting my clothes is what it what it ended up being so i love this concept uh, not so much about giving away my clothes um but uh, airbnb did this and I, I love this concept about renting out a room in my house, um, basically to anybody who's willing to do it. So I, I went down to New York and I uh, found a great place that, you know, midtown Manhattan that was $78 a night and it was a beautiful room. 
and it was basically like a bed and breakfast. Um, and this is just excess space that those people had. So they, they, they're renting that out. So I love that. So it was a no-brainer that where I see this industry going, a company like GetAround.com. They're called the Airbnb of the auto industry. This is where I think that it has a huge opportunity as this kind of example of a business where uh, if you own a car, you're literally not using it 22 hours out of the day. Why wouldn't you offer it for rent? Just offer it for rent when during set day, set hours when you know you're not going to be using it. So just put it up there, put a price. They give you a little plug-in uh, for your uh, lighter that allows people to unlock the device, unlock your car and start your car from their mobile device. They can rent, pay for it right on the spot. Insurance is covered and they drive off in your car for an allotted period of time. That is where I think that the mobile industry is going to excel. This burstable uh, opportunity to drive to generate revenue based on downtime, some asset that isn't working. Yeah, you've heard it get around. Ottawa guy, Sam Zaid, won TechCrunch Disrupt in New York City, had to move to California to go and get some money, but that's another story. Uh, so I, I love that kind of concept. Uh, another example of that is something called GigWalk. Uh, an interview will go up uh, soon on Untether, which is uh, uh, Ariel Seidman, who uh, built this company, is basically a burstable uh, opportunity to generate income for yourself. So if you're walking down the street, you can actually check in and say, listen, I'm here. Are there any opportunities for me to do some work? And some people will post that work with, an, a, fixed, with a fixed price on it. You do the work. You get paid. It's like... You know, is you know whatever it is. Check a menu inside of a of a of a restaurant uh, for an updated for a food site, or to go and pick somebody's dry cleaning up. It doesn't matter. That kind of burstable activity. God, I love that kind of stuff. It's it's creating efficiencies. It's generating income during downtimes. Yeah, it's 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 basically um, micro sharing of uh, personal resources. Yeah, and if if you extend I think what's interesting is I, I agree. I think that you know there's a lot of inefficiencies in our infrastructure, whether it's communications, whether it's transportation, whether it's banking. No matter what it is, you, you look all over and you see, you know, if you could redo it from scratch today, what would be a much more efficient way of doing it, right? And obviously, there's things you can't do, and that you know, replacing every road, more efficient roads, costs you fifty billion trillion dollars because it's a huge, massive investment of yep. breaking buildings down to put more efficient roads through and such. So. It's obviously unrealistic, but you know the micro model of you know distributing transportation amongst cars, and so instead of having everybody have their own car, that you share cars, whether that's a zip uh, zip car style or whether it's the the Airbnb style, or um, in, in terms of micro sharing of your resources, it, it's interesting because you know I might get hassled going back to the United States for saying this, but you know there are benefits to communism, which is you know having sharing resources for the good of everybody rather than just having individual ownership of stuff. Yep. And if you, if you extended that sharing cars to the, to the extreme where you said nobody owned cars, everybody, every car was micro-shared. And you had those parking lots full of 1,000 cars that you only needed to use twice a day, and everybody going around, around during the day who's at work and has their car sitting there, you know, half the cars could be taken off the road, which would eliminate half the pollution that's out there right now. So... You know all those kind of those micro sharing opportunities to to find those inefficiencies in in what we're doing and in, in, in the inefficiencies in what we're using of our own stuff, whether it's our own house or whether it's our own car, no matter what it is. Uh, I think are great. I, I I'm I don't really care about the uh, revenue generating potential for a person on it, but I look at it as the larger social good of saying, well, if if we can if we can change those attitudes, if we can if we can even convert you know a couple percentage of um, houses or hotels or um, cars or whatever to use that, it'll make a noticeable impact on the social fabric of society and saying, well, people are like, well, what if someone steals my car? Like, I'm sure that's the first question I'll get asked. If I said that to someone, well, you know, you can rent your car. It's like, well, what if they don't bring it back? Like, that's going to be the first question. And if it's like if you rent your house out to somebody, well, you're not there. They're like, well, what if they steal something? That's, that's automatically yeah. right now the first questions that are going to be asked. And I think that the more people experience these and, you know, Airbnb and these micro car sharing uh, services, the more comfortable a larger portion of society will be with that. So, you know what? Don't leave your diamond ring in your car or put a safe in your house or these, these, these small things that you can do, which ultimately are good to do anyways, because if nobody stores valuables in their car, 
then there's less incentive to break into cars generally, aside from stealing the actual car itself. Obviously. Right. But you know, I, th I think these these services have great value, and that mobile is the enabler for them because. I don't want to have to, on my desktop here, say at 3 o'clock today, I'm going to need a car at Westgate where I'm working. I want to be at Westgate at 3 o'clock working and go, oh, I need to go to an appointment. Let me pull out my phone. Is there a car here? Yes. Unlock the, start the car. Boom, I'm good to go. And yep. bring it back and start paying pay for, for it. Right? So. Yep. Well, th th those are, I, I mean, this is an industry that is nascent and there's a lot of people scrambling for this. I, you know, there's another company that I interviewed um, from Chicago called Air Run, S same kind of concept, uh, but really targeted towards students, uh, you know, as a way to for them to to kind of generate a little bit of extra side income as well. Uh, but the big one for me is get around and uh, and that concept of the Airbnb for automobiles, uh, because I, I do believe that this is this is where a mobile first approach. I'm, I'm looking at all these cars. There's got to be one that I can use to get out of here, whether it's a getaway or not. And and when you start to walk through it, it's like they've covered everything. It's insured. You've got full coverage and full insurance. Uh, in order to be able to rent the car, you've had to have given up your personal identity uh, in order to be able to give a credit card or that kind of tra traceable uh, information. Um, and uh, and so you start knocking off the concerns one at a time. And uh, I think we're going to see start to see a lot more of these types of uh, plays, these types of applications. Anything that is, um, uh, you know, that between point A and point B, if I have to get there or if I'm closer to something, then that, that works. And it started with Amazon, you know, in the warehouses, when you, when you ordered a book, you know, their logistics are so great that when I order a book, it pings the person that's closest to that book so that it creates an efficiency that allows to get it out of the warehouse and shipped within 24 hours. That's what we're going to start to see in our, in our lives is that we're going to have an efficient use of resources like that. And I think that you know there is there's a a worldly good by reducing the number of cars out there uh there's a uh protection side which is reducing theft but it's also there's there's a revenue side you got a, a dumb stupid asset that everybody said the minute you drive it off the lot it devalues by 30 percent well here's a way to actually make up that gap that 30 percent gap by renting it out when you aren't using it you have an example of something like this that you like jeff um, that, I, that I rent it when I'm not using it? No, 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 no. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that um, uh, more, more along the lines of a company that you look at or, or a concept that you look at and say, wow, this is, this is where I see some great potential. I think that, you know, when you talk about what concepts in mobile have, have great potential to move forward, it's, the, it's all the concepts in which allow you to do individual things on an on-demand basis. So... Mobile is about being wherever you are with, with your device and accessing products, services, um, or information when you want it, when you think of it, not having to pre-plan that information out. And there's so many services out there, whether it's travel, um, whether it's accommodations, whether it's car rentals, as we've talked about, whether it's restaurant um, reservations, yeah. that you really have to, to pre-plan ahead of time and say, well, I need to know where I'm going to be. And maybe this is just just me, and I, I like someone asked me, "What do you do next week?" I'm like, "I don't know. Ask me next week." Yeah. Like I, I don't I don't plan that far ahead. I put dates in my calendar that other people have reserved for me, and I tell people, "Book it in my calendar if you want me to show up there," and that's how the time gets reserved for it. But otherwise, it's like I don't know. What do you do next week? I don't know. What do you want to do? So let let's do whatever you want to do, right? Let's not pre-plan it. Someone's like, "When are you going to the cottage this summer?" I'm like, "I don't know. Whenever I have a weekend, I'm not doing anything else." Right. So I, I think that kind of attitude, and that's maybe just me and some of the circle of my friends who, who we make kind of decisions on the fly like that, I prefer to say, well, I don't know what restaurant I want to go to. I'll figure out what I feel like I want to go to when I'm hungry, yep. right? So maybe I don't feel like Chinese food. Maybe I don't feel like a good restaurant, but I know I'm here. So what restaurant can I go around to that has a free table right here? So instead of having to make a reservation at a restaurant ahead of time, if I'm around 17 restaurants, show me the ones that have open seats right now and what they serve, and I'll pick a restaurant, and I'll say, click, okay, reserve my seat right now. I'll walk over, and I'll come to your restaurant, right? Absolutely. Or I'll, I'll drive over and come to it. So I think those are the kind of services that the problem with that is the infrastructure requirements for hooking all that stuff up are, are pretty steep in that just like we talk about mobile payments taking a while because every single retailer out there needs to upgrade their terminals that they use, when you talk about integrating on-demand services, every business or service that wants to be on-demand needs to make a change that's compatible. You can't have seven different services for it. It just doesn't work. It needs to be 
you know, one service for booking restaurants or, or multiple that have access to all the restaurants. Basically, the service providers can't be exclusive. Otherwise, the value of the service as a whole goes down. Just like the car example you gave, if there's six different companies in Ottawa where I have to log into six different apps to right. see if there's a car available, I'm not going to use it. That reduces the usability of it. It needs to be the case where either the different cars can be subscribed to different services, and those services can coordinate to understand when a car is and is not available, or you have a monopoly of services in which you get into some people's testy discussions there around the benefits or detriments of a monopoly. But I think in many cases, I'd rather a monopoly, I'd rather see governments in particular start to try and do some of this stuff and say, you know what, we're providing it. Yes, it's a monopoly, but for the greater good, it's going to be a monopoly. And we'll pay to have the service innovate or we'll pay for the connections between multiple services that are there to make sure that the benefit for our city, our province, our country, our state, or society is much better than trying to have individual investment money go down the tubes. Like, don't put $100 million into four companies doing the same thing. You know, put $100 million into four companies trying to solve four different problems, and then you might actually get some solved rather than having them all fight each other out and end up with a $50 million company and just lost $300 million in, in value that could go into other areas of society, other areas of, of small companies. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, that last point is, is, uh, is very important, is that um, what I like about what these companies are doing, companies like Get Around, companies like GigWalk, is that they're taking a, um, a challenge uh, that isn't about checking in and about location-based services and isn't about the couponing and all that stuff that, that is kind of lost its way and is non-innovating. And they've, they've looked at a, at a problem that we're facing today, and, and they're, they're innovating. They're applying a mobile layer to innovate around it, and that's what I, that's what I look forward to these guys. And I, I think it's an interesting play, and I, and I hope that we can bring examples like this forward in all of our episodes of industries where we think that, listen, this is a disruptive play. So for me, it's been getaround.com. For me, it's been gigwalk. Um, and uh, and for me, it's they've been based on something like Airbnb, which is a, which is an insane valuation. I think even Airbnb's valuation is you know hundreds of millions of dollars now. So um, I uh, I like these guys who are uh, who are taking a, a new tack on on something old like this. Is Airbnb technically the largest hotel in the world? Well, I think it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's the largest network of rooms. I think um, and and some of the deals are great, but. Uh, and and their mobile application is is staggeringly beautiful as well. And and uh, when you land in New York City and you don't have a place to stay, and within a moment you can find a place, book it, pay for it, um, based on other people's reviews. I think that that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty powerful. Um, they got fifteen thousand three hundred sixty four cities in one hundred eighty four countries. Yeah. So if you've got that many cities, you assume that there is multiple places in each one of those cities that yep. are available, right? And so if you look at that as a, as a distributed hotel across the world, what is the largest number of rooms of any single hotel chain in the world? You know, Airbnb might be up there with that availability and not just up there, but okay, so the Marriott in Orlando has a thousand rooms in it in one spot. Yep. So if you want to go to somewhere on the other side of Orlando, that's not a great option for you. But if you look at Airbnb and you say, okay, where am I going to go? Let's plot the point in the middle. The probability of them having a place there or in the future them having a place in that spot versus where a particular hotel can clear off four acres of land to, yep. to, to build a massive structure is a lot better and, and it's a lot more environmentally friendly because you're as you say you're using resources that already exist and you can pick something that matches your taste you know if you go on their website and you scan through some of the pictures of different places that are there hey that's crazy people have funky homes that yep. you can go and stay and you're like wow this is like part of my tourist thing is staying in this crazy home well, part of the part of the uh, beauty of it, and and I think that you hit it right on there, is is that a lot all of these uh, all of these applications that are localized like this allow you to uh, determine where you want to be, and find a spot exactly where you want to be, and that's what Airbnb does, and that's what uh, Get Around does as well. Is that it's the place you are that's important, and if you if you literally want to be somewhere in, you know in New York in, in Soho, um, or if you want to be on a street and you want to engage with that with a culture or w within that um, uh, within that neighborhood, that's what this allows you to do. It. It's it, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to stay in Midtown if you want to be, uh, you know, in the financial district just because of the price. Now you actually have the ability to be where you want to be, eat, stay, play, do whatever you want to do uh, where you want, as opposed to where the hotel actually is. And I think that that's very important. 
So I hope that we've given a glimpse of what uh, opportunities for large companies, it doesn't matter if you're small or large, but large companies need to do to be able to embrace a little bit more of the mobile so that they can add a couple of zeros to their bottom line, add some more users, and add some value in the mobile space from a mobile-first approach. And then a quick look at, at uh, you know, from my perspective anyways, the, 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 the opportunities that mobile brings to disrupt existing uh, industry in what Airbnb is doing on the mobile side, what GetAround is doing on the mobile side, and even what uh, GigWalk is doing on the mobile side. So if you found value here, let us know. Do you agree with this, disagree? We'd love to hear from you, untethered gmail.com. You can find uh, Jeff at bacon, um, uh, bacononthego.com. Leave some comments wherever you've found this. We really appreciate it, even on LinkedIn. Great discussion on LinkedIn, oddly enough, um, about some of the episodes that we posted in the last little while. Um, so if you use any of these great ideas to start companies, Remember where you heard them when you go public. Just saying, you know, just just give us a little bit of credit. All we're asking for is like five to ten percent equity stake. Hey, if you're in California, I'll take half of one percent. Half of one percent, yeah. So we're gonna wrap up. That has been uh, episode number twenty-one of Two Guys on Mobile. We will be here next week for episode number twenty-two, um, and you know, uh, twenty-one episodes in legal in the states. Uh, and I really appreciate you guys who are watching, listening, wherever you may be. Thank you guys for coming back week after week and and uh, contributing to this conversation. And we'd love, definitely, love to hear from you. And if we're hitting the mark, let us know. If you like the format, let us know. If you want us to change anything, let us know. If you want us to talk about something or investigate anything, let us know. Uh, we will answer every email that comes in. You can reach me right at untetheredgmail.com. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. We really want to hear from you. Bacon. Bacononthego.com. At the Suave Hog on Twitter. And, of course, you can find me at untethered.tv or untetheredmobile.com or at Rob Woodbridge on the Twitter world, the Twitter sphere. And if there's anything else that you guys want to know, let us know. And we'll see you guys next week for Two Guys on Mobile. See you, Jeff. See you, Rob.